Welcome to Indianapolis, Indiana, USA, and the 28th General Assembly and Conventions. Bienvenidos a Indianapolis, Indiana, Estados Unidos, y a la 28 Asamblea General y Convenciones. We're happy to be back. Estamos contentos de estar aquí otra vez. In a city of diversity, action, and houses of worship. En una ciudad llena de diversidad, acción y templos. Our theme is to make Christ-like disciples in the nations. Nuestro lema es para que haya discípulos de Cristo en todas las naciones. Underlying this theme are our three core values. Sustentando a este lema están nuestros tres valores fundamentales. We are Christian. Somos cristianos. We are holiness. Somos sagrados. We are missional. Somos misionales. Tonight, our focus is, we are Christian. Esta noche, hablaremos de uno de ellos. Somos cristianos. So now, prepare to worship God in this holy convocation. Así que ahora, prepárense para orar a Dios en esta Sagrada Asamblea. Amen. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us and let the songs of praise be lifted from our hearts and through our lips and give glory and honor to him. We welcome you once again to the 28th General Assembly and Conventions being held in Indianapolis, Indiana, USA. And as we begin our service tonight, we want to welcome two very special groups worshiping with us. We will need the house lights up just a little, I think. We want to welcome Nazarene chaplains. These servants of God in the church make significant contributions to ministry and service in their respective communities. Where are the chaplains tonight? Would you stand right over here? Welcome, brothers and sisters. We thank you for all that you do for our Lord and the kingdom and honor your ministry. Thank you very much. And the second group we want to welcome tonight is a group of children's quizzers. They're not only the hope of the future, but they're the life of the church today. Let's give them a round of applause. Are you over here, kids? Where are you? All the children's quizzers. Some of, they're all over the building. Thank you. I've met some of these children in the hallways and there were gold medals and silver medals and bronze medals and I want to say to all of you children, you all won first place today for giving your hearts and lives to the study of the Word of God. Amen. I also want to uh, take just a special moment, a uh, privilege. It's a joy to have our General Superintendent Emeritus with us this evening. And uh, it just seemed like we should take a moment to celebrate the 70th anniversary of Dr. and Mrs. Eugene Stowe. Dr. Ms. Stowe, would you stand right down here? We welcome you here. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. And again, we're delighted to have all of our Meriti with us and uh, thank God for them and for their continued service to the church. Adoramos al que está sentado en el trono y al Cordero, porque solo él merece toda honra, toda gloria y majestad. Osana en las alturas. Tu pueblo te alaba, Señor. Father God, we have praised your name. We have worshipped your holy name. And we pray that our praise have been acceptable to you. 
receive our praise tonight. And as you receive our praise tonight, we ask you to send your spirit to us. Father God, missionary God, who became a missionary son, who is sending his missionary spirit to his missionary church. Could you please move us tonight to be your hand and your feet to this world that needs to know the graces of your holy name? Could you please come and dwell among us tonight to turn your church, this church, on fire for the mission of God. Could you please, please dwell in this place tonight? Could you sensitize our hearts? Could you bless the preacher? Could you bless the word? Could you bless, bless every, everything that is going to happen here tonight? So that your church, your church could continue carrying the mission of reconciliation. Send us out tonight as your ambassadors. Give us the privilege of making the appeal to this world through the church of the Nazarene. For it is in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Welcome to Eurasia, a place of beginnings, a place of history, a place of diversity. It is in this diverse region where the, most of the world's main religions have begun, from Islam to Hinduism, from Judaism to Buddhism, and of course Christianity. This beautiful piece of God's landscape has been home to many of the world's shaping philosophies, political systems, and theological developments, and yet... In the midst of all diversity and challenges, the Lord is blessing his church, the church of the Nazarene, as his agent of transformation and hope. I greet you in the name of Jesus on behalf of more than 240,000 Eurasian Nazarenes and their children. They are your brothers and sisters who have faithfully embraced their mission to transform our world in Christ, like Christ, and for Christ. They are gathering today in more than 4,500 organized churches and 3,000 church-type missions. They are fulfilling their mission by planting at least three new churches every single day, by adding more than 200 new believers daily, as in today and by welcoming an average of 500 new Nazarenes every week. But they need your prayers. They need your prayers of intercession, of solidarity, and support. As we gather here and to celebrate and to be moved by God's presence in our midst, let's also pray for those who could not join us in this sacred assembly. First, remember the persecuted believers in South Asia, in India, in the Middle East, in Central Asia, and in the many creative access countries of Eurasia. They are persecuted daily. They worship in silence. 
but they witness with boldness. Please remember tonight the poor and helpless in every corner of the Eurasia region. Many of our Nazarene brothers and sisters are slum dwellers. They belong to outcast tribes. They live in refugee camps. They are immigrants with no land and nationality. They are harassed and helpless. But the growth of the church is happening among them. They have found abundant life in Christ and love in the fellowship of these people called Eurasia Nazarenes. And also remember the postmodern affluent people of Europe. They who seem to have everything. They face the emptiness and skepticism that is bringing their cultures and nations apart from God. And yet, in their midst, there is a family called Nazarenes. These Nazarenes continue finding creative ways to minister to their own people, to their context, to their generation, and to their empty hearts. We also pray on their behalf tonight. It is with this spirit of thanksgiving and mission that we join you in this global celebration. We are privileged to share and celebrate with you the power of one Lord, one Savior, one Spirit, and one Church. We believe that God has been at the center of a wonderful holiness movement that has reached every nation of Eurasia. We celebrate that this movement this growing movement is the aggregate of individuals, congregations, and districts who have realized that one can make a difference when empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. Let us then celebrate the power of the Spirit of God, the power of one in Eurasia and in the world. It took one courageous believer to start the Reformation. It took one courageous holiness believer to start a movement of, of hard holiness. It takes one. No, I had never met a Christian in my life. Why would they pray for me? I had never read the Bible. But lots of bad things happened in my life. I felt like I want to die. I heard about a church that was helping the refugees there. Right after I entered the church, I felt the peace and the love of, of God and everything. And that's when I surrendered my life to Christ. It was love in action. It's amazing how much God can can put love in our hearts and can use us. I, I look at the future with great optimism. And all the prayers of all believers all around the world was ones who helped me. God is amazing. He would never ever let somebody go. Never. It took one courageous holiness believer to start a movement of, of hard holiness. It takes one spark to start a fire. Amen. Tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock we'll be gathering in this room for our morning worship service, the official beginning of our General Assembly, the 28th General Assembly of the Church of the Nazarene. Dr. Jess Middendorf will be our speaker. We'll conclude that service with Holy Communion. 
Those of you who have agreed to assist in serving communion, we're going to ask that immediately upon the benediction tonight, you'll come forward, find a place to be seated, and uh, we'll give you instructions as to your assignments uh, tomorrow. Our offering goal for the General Assembly and conventions in 2013 is $300,000. 10% of each offering goes to Nazarene Compassionate Ministry projects. If you're watching this service via web streaming, you can go online to www.nazarene.org slash give and you may give electronically and we hope that you will do so. There were incidentally over 5,000 computers tuned in to the service last night and we're confident that that number will grow every night. In the building tonight, as Dr. Graves said last evening, we'll take whatever you have, watches, rings, children, well, not children, but we'll take about anything else you want to give and about any other form you would like to give it. And we do want you to join with us. We need about $50,000 tonight. And if everybody in this room gave a minimum of $5, that would do it. Just a minimum of $5. So reach in your neighbor's pocket and get out $5. And uh, if you have children, give them five. Children, turn to your grandma and grandpa or your aunt or your uncle and put on a sad look and say, may I have $5 for the offering? And uh, let's see what we can do tonight. We do appreciate your generosity and we look forward to being able to assist not only in the expenses of this General Assembly, but also in assisting our, um, our people in crisis around the world. There are children, I believe, who are serving as ushers tonight, and uh, in just a few moments, we'll be praying, and they will be uh, serving us for the offering. Uh, Dr. Jerry Porter, grandfather to Ben and Nate. That's probably about all I need to say about Jerry Porter. Father to Amy, who is in heaven, and Bill, who is father of Ben and Nate and his lovely wife, Kristen, and husband of Tony, a friend, a colleague, a dreamer, pastor, missionary, strategist, Evangelist, district superintendent, general superintendent. I think the best thing I can say about Jerry Porter is that he is a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. A man who is indwelt by the Spirit of God and that presence of God shows forth in him over and over and over again in every situation. He's my friend. He's our general superintendent. And in a few moments, he will come and bring to us the word of the Lord. I want to pray for the offering, and then we'll move forward with the service. Heavenly Father, we do bless you tonight for your goodness and for your love. As our ushers take their places, And we prepare to receive this offering. And we prepare to give in this offering. We do so with grateful hearts. Bless every portion of the service as we move forward. We ask it in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen and amen. War. Famine. Poverty. Disaster. They leave millions of victims behind. And many of them are children. And so many of them need help. In so many ways that it's almost beyond imagining. Can you really make a difference? Where do you even start? You start with one. When you sponsor a child, you provide nutritious meals to feed his body and medicine to heal it. Which means he's more able to fight disease 
grow up healthy and work. When you sponsor a child, you give her education to feed her mind, which means she has a chance to get out of poverty and contribute to her family and community. When you sponsor a child, you show them that they're loved by God and that they matter. Millions of children need to have that love, that hope, the chance for a better life. So what can you do? Take one step. One child sponsored is one life changed forever. I know. I know. I know. I know. It's one of you sponsored me. This were the faithful sponsors uh, that sponsored me throughout my uh, elementary and my high school education. I was born and raised in the Philippines. Child sponsorship gave me the opportunity to have a quality education and to be able to dream as high as I can and, and move forward with my life. It brought me to where I am right now. Sponsorship is future for kids. It, it just opened a lot of opportunities. Now we can just dream big and, and be what we want to be. NCM's Child Sponsorship Program have contributed to what I am doing right now being a web developer and a graphics designer at World Mission Communication Center. I am blessed because one of you sponsored me. One of you sponsored me. One of you sponsored me. Just to be sponsored means a lot of opportunities. I look back at it and I'm like, if I didn't have that education, I, I don't even know where, where I would be at, you know. And child sponsorship did that for me. It, it opened that door for me. The Word of God teaches that there is a very special place in the heart of God for children. The Bible also teaches there's a very special place in the heart of God for the poor. So tell me, what happens when we choose to love and bless and help a poor child? Well, with one act of compassion, we have deeply moved the heart of God. My wife and I befriended some street children in Calcutta, India, near Mother Teresa's home for the destitute and the dying. Uh, their situation was heartbreaking. The very next day, we attended the district assembly in that same mega city. And the service began with a stirring musical presentation from children from the Nazarene Child Development Centers. We were overwhelmed by the contrast. These children were being dramatically impacted by the loving generosity of sponsors like you. Uh, for several years, my wife and I have been sponsoring six children through Nazarene Compassionate Ministries, and tonight they brought me the pictures again to remind me of the six children that we're, we're sponsoring. Tony, here's, here's, the, here's the faces. Uh, my wife informed me that six is not enough. Of course, she's never satisfied. So tonight we're going to sign up for four more because she wants us to sponsor 10 children every month. And if you love Jesus, you'll do what my wife is doing. Now, the, the truth is we'd like to invite you to join us. Would you at least sponsor one child? Would you, if you sponsor one, would you sponsor two? You know you cannot take your money to heaven. I assume you've heard that in the good preaching in your church. The only way you can take your wealth to heaven is to invest it in people because there will be people in heaven. What a wonderful way to express our love for Christ by loving these children everywhere in the world. We actually need 3,000 sponsors for children all over the world today. Tonight we're praying for 1,500 sponsors in this congregation who will say, yes, I'll be willing to give 25 U.S. dollars per month to make an eternal difference. Uh, on your seat when you arrived, you saw a sponsorship card uh, like this. 
And would you, would you kindly take your sponsorship card? And, and, um, and while the children are singing, would you, would you write the name your mother gave you on this card? And, uh, and would you give us some information? You don't have to give any money tonight. All you have to do is just give us your information. We'll contact you and allow you to connect with a child somewhere around the world, and your love will make a difference for them forever. We have 300 child ushers who will receive these commitment cards. After you've signed them, please pass them to the aisles, and these children will assist us. Now, tonight we have a very special guest. On the video, you saw Sharon Ruyoda. Would you join me in welcoming him, please? This is one of our child sponsors who's now serving the Lord in ministry. Amen. Uh, Sherwin, do you enjoy being a spectacle for everyone to look at and say, oh, can I touch a sponsored child, please? He's a living example of the impact that uh, child sponsorship can have. He doesn't know this, but we have a surprise for him tonight. I just told him I wanted to come here so they could see a, a sponsored child. We have some special guests here tonight we want you to meet. You thought your sponsors had already gone to be with Jesus, but they're alive and well and in the service tonight. Would you please welcome the Happenies as they come to greet this child that they sponsored many, many years ago. Jim and Betty Happney, here they are. Go give them a hug. <laughs> Thank you. may be seated and listen to the children's choir. As you sign, please, your pledge card to sponsor a child and to send it to the aisles, please. We need 1,500 at least tonight. God bless you. In your registration packet, you were given a card prepared by the Board of General Superintendents. And on the card, we talk about the core values of the Church of the Nazarene. We are a... Christian people. David Graves emphasized this powerfully on Thursday night. We are a holiness people, and last night Dr. Warwick spoke moving, a moving message challenging us to be a holy people. My assigned topic for this evening is we are a missional people. And what is the mission, as you read it on the card, what is the mission of the Church of the Nazarene? To make Christ-like disciples in the nations. At this General Assembly, the General Superintendents are sharing a vision statement that is on our heart. Our vision statement is transforming people, communities, and nations. I have a question for you. Is the Lord satisfied with who we are? Or might the Lord want to bless our church and make us even more effective? We're just one of the many denominations in the world, but... Would the Lord be pleased if the Church of the Nazarene grew to 10 million members in the near future? Or would the Lord be opposed to that? This evening, we want to focus our attention on the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was a central message of Jesus Christ. In fact, Scripture records in the Gospels, he referred to the kingdom of God or some similar statement, kingdom of heaven, over a hundred times. The scripture says Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. It's found in Matthew. Jesus traveled from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God, found in Luke. Mark simply says Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God has come near. Now, some of us have wanted to reduce the kingdom of God to our personal experience with Christ. We enter the kingdom of God. Or to the institutional church or a denomination. Or perhaps we limit the kingdom of God to compassionate ministries, social reform, or biblical justice. Some would limit the kingdom of God to the future reign of Jesus. Well, the kingdom of God is all of these, but much more. The kingdom of God has already come and is yet to come. For purposes of this message, would you allow me to define the kingdom of God as the lordship of Jesus Christ at work through the church, transforming people, communities, and nations with hope, love, and peace. I had the privilege of 
serving as uh, E. Stanley Jones' secretary and traveling companion and valet when he was an 87-year-old missionary evangelist. I carried his bags. After all, I am a porter. <laughs> and um, at that, the time that I was with him, the 87-year-old missionary evangelist, he was writing his last and final book, The Unshakable Kingdom and the Unchanging Person. The amazing truth is Jesus now offers us this unshakable kingdom. It's his gift to us. Scripture reads, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire, Hebrews chapter 12. All the kingdoms of our life are shakable. Our health, our wealth, our families, our industries, our governments, political parties, economic systems, Everything is shakable, but not so. The unshakable kingdom of God that Jesus now wants to offer to us. E. Stanley Jones said, discover the kingdom, surrender to the kingdom, and make the kingdom your life loyalty. I remember E. Stanley Jones, when he was preaching, many times he would invite the congregation to raise their hand and raise three fingers and in English, it's three words. It may be more than that in your language, but Jesus is Lord. Would you raise your hand and raise three fingers and repeat with me in your language? Jesus is Lord. Raise your hand higher. Say it louder. Jesus is Lord. That's the Lordship of Jesus. The kingdom of God has come. Now, this is my brother. This is Alfonso Porter. I'm Jerry Porter, and of course, Alfonso Porter is a strategy coordinator for English Caribbean. He's the superintendent for the Guiana Demerara Esquibo District. And Alfonso Porter and Jerry Porter, we have the same father. Right. <laughs> and we do. We have the same father. <laughs> Come back with me here. You ready? Together, we pray, your, your kingdom, kingdom come. come. Together. Together. We, we pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to our King, King of Kings, Kings Jesus our Lord. Lord. Together, Together, we enjoy, we enjoy the, the same privileges as citizens of, of the kingdom, kingdom of, God. of God. Kindly turn to the person next to you and greet them as your compatriot ambassador of the kingdom of God. Tell them in your own language, the kingdom of God has come near. Would you do that? Would the Lord be pleased if the Church of the Nazarene grew to 10 million members in the near future? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the word says that uh, we are ambassadors. We are. We're ambassadors of the kingdom. Jesus gave the 12 power and authority to drive out demons cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God, Luke chapter 9. We proclaim the kingdom of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. After his resurrection, Jesus instructed the disciples, do not leave Jerusalem until you have been endued with power from on high. Wait for the gift my father promised. And then they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom with a small k? Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They were seeking the earthly, temporal kingdom. They were seeking the kingdom with a small K. But Jesus wanted to commission these, his disciples, as ambassadors of the kingdom with a capital K. He answered, it's not for you to know the time or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and on to the ends of the earth. We must experience our personal and our collective corporate Pentecost. Our hearts are purified by faith, as Peter testified. We receive the Holy Spirit power, power to witness. And we become ambassadors, ambassadors of the kingdom of God. We embrace Jesus as the sanctifying Lord. He is the Lord 
of all of our heart and life. To believe in the kingdom is to believe in the lordship of Jesus. And to believe in the lordship of Christ is to believe in holiness. Would you raise your three fingers and repeat after me, Jesus is Lord. One more time, Jesus is Lord. On the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus reminded us, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And in a classic parable, Jesus said, you know what the kingdom of God is like? It's like yeast. A woman took the yeast and mixed it into 60 pounds of flour until it worked throughout all the dough. Luke 13. We leaven our world with God's transforming activity. We are the yeast in our communities, in our families, in our neighborhoods. You are God's leaven in your world. Tell the person next to you, you are God's leaven in your world, in your language. Wake them up, wake them up gently and say it again. You are God's leaven in your world. At this General Assembly, the Board of General Superintendents is emphasizing seven global missional priorities. Last evening, Dr. Warwick spoke eloquently on the need for personal and corporate prayer and told a wonderful miracle of prayer in America, rescuing the life of a person in New Guinea. Prayer is part of a meaningful worship. It is, what is prayer? It's our partnership that releases God in a world where God honors human freedom. Tomorrow morning, Dr. Middendorf will underscore the importance of theological coherence. Tomorrow evening, Dr. Tola will remind us again of God's call to ministry and to service. A key priority we will want to emphasize during the coming years is transformational leadership. Of these seven, there are four that I want to highlight this evening. Purposeful compassion, passionate evangelism, intentional discipleship, and church development. As ambassadors of the kingdom, we practice and we live purposeful compassion. It's a lifestyle. Jesus looked at the rich young ruler and loved him, the Bible says. Sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus said how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Our heritage, our Wesley heritage, our Brazil heritage compels us, inspires us, and moves us to minister to and to empower the weak, the poor, the marginalized. We teach our children to sing a song. Cristo me ama bien lo sé. Jesus loves me. This I know. Now we don't teach our children. Now here's how you sing that song. Jesus loves your soul, but doesn't care at all about the rest of you. We're not saving souls, my friend. We've been commissioned to love persons, people. And we love them in whatever they're experiencing, whatever their situations may be. If Jesus loves me, then he cares about the illness, the pain, the failure, the sorrow, the bankruptcy, the divorce, whatever I'm facing. He loves me, and the church must love me as a person. Compassionate ministry is not some optional additive. The secondary option for the church's ministry. It is the tangible expression through us of God's love for our world and for our neighbors. We, as ambassadors of the kingdom, must love people and respond in compassion to them, whatever their needs may be. The Word of God says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You've loved righteousness and hated wickedness. This evening we were invited, and I trust even as I'm speaking, the Spirit of God will move your heart to sponsor a child to help us to communicate compassion to these children. You'll never meet, perhaps. You may not have the joy the Sherwin sponsors, the happenings had, but you can meet them in heaven. We celebrate the 10% of whatever we raise this week and the 300 thousand dollars we trust will raise in offerings that thirty thousand dollars will go for compassionate ministry disaster relief around the world thank you for your generosity thank you for being nazarenes who love others thank you because you are god's leaven in your world 
We are known as Nazarenes for purposeful compassion as a lifestyle. The kingdom of God has come near when we are compassionate. Second priority, we're ambassadors of the kingdom as we embrace passionate evangelism. So how do we, how does a person enter this kingdom? The scripture says that Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the kingdom of God has come near. Can you hear the Lord say that? The kingdom of God has come near. So what response did the Lord expect? Repent, Jesus says, and believe the good news. Life transformation. Jesus also reminds us, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. And finally, Jesus told Nicodemus, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Oh, the kingdom of God, how do we enter in? It's given by grace to the humbly penitent who believe and are born again. We celebrate 11.7, almost 12 million persons who profess faith in Jesus through the Church of the Nazarene Jesus film ministry during the last 17 years. Praise God. Hallelujah. 12 million. This is passionate evangelism. This partnership with Campus Crusade for Christ, it reminds us that the kingdom of God, it often expresses itself with partnerships between congregations instead of competition between congregations. Hello? Partnership between congregations, between districts, between denominations, between us and parachurch organizations. We are all trying to accomplish one great thing, the advancement and the arrival of the kingdom of God in our neighborhood and in our world. We'll partner with anybody to accomplish that. When Jesus gave the Great Commission, there were 200 million persons on the earth. 1,800 years later, there was 1 billion people in the year 1,800. Today, there are 7 billion people who share your oxygen. And the world's population continues to grow. Another billion every 12 to 13 years. If it was the Great Commission when the Lord declared it, guess what it is today? It's the greater and greater and greater commission. And the assignment becomes greater every day we live. There are 7 billion people, and this is our great commission. This is our generation. We can't win those who've already died, and we can't win those who are not yet born. But we have 7 billion people that are our assignment. This is our great commission. On average, our particular denomination, the Nazarene family, we've doubled every 15 years. Today we are... Over 2 million Nazarenes, praise the Lord. 28,000 congregations, 159 world areas. Praise God, hallelujah. Go ahead, clap, come on. At the present, at the present rate of growth, we will be 10 million by 2044. But I have a question for you. Could could we accelerate a bit the rate of growth of the Church of the Nazarene? Could, could we move from low to second gear? I don't care if it's a motorcycle. I don't care if it's a Honda. Could, could we move to, to second gear? Could we, could we accelerate, by the grace of God, evangelism around the world? Would the Lord be pleased if the Church of the Nazarene grew to 10 million in the near future? Uh, what's the ratio of Nazarenes to the global population? In 1910, line everybody in the whole world in a straight line, and every 100,000 persons is a Nazarene. In 1910, every 100,000 persons is the next Nazarene. Today, every 3,200th person is a Nazarene. Every 3,200 persons is another Nazarene. Praise God. Amen. And by... Reaching 10 million, every 900th person will be a Nazarene. We have a great mission. We are part of God's great family. We are not the only church, but we are a church taking responsibility to win the world for Christ and all we can do to do that by the grace of God. 
If every Nazarene would win one person to Christ every three years, if every Nazarene would bring one person to Christ into the church every three years, we would be 10 million not in 2044, but in 2020, seven years from now. I'm so glad the gospel reached you. I'm so glad we're in Saved by Grace. I'm so glad someone told me about Jesus. We have an incredible opportunity. Would each one of the Nazarenes around the world bring one, una sola persona, just one person to Christ during the next three years and teach that person to do the same? My wife and I became friends uh, to Victor. I love Mexican food. My wife takes me to eat Mexican so that I'll do certain tasks around the home. And he was at the Mexican restaurant, and we witnessed to him, and we talked to Victor there in, in Florida. And one day, to my surprise, he asked me if I would baptize his baby, baby daughter. And I was delighted. Pastor Gary Jakes and I pastored, uh, we baptized precious little baby Victoria. Her mother, Deanna, uh, is from Bulgaria. So Victor and Deanna, they're both undocumented immigrants living in Florida. And we had that little Saturday afternoon service. Half of the crowd was Mexican, the other half of the crowd was Bulgarian. I reminded them that this baptism of this precious little girl was testimony of the prevenient grace of God that covered baby Victoria. I led everyone in that room in the sinner's prayer. I told them it was their responsibility to lead Victoria's steps to Christ. During the following months, I urged Victor to marry Deanna. That seemed appropriate. He refused. A couple of years later, baby Patrick, the little brother, was born. And I offered to baptize Patrick, but now Victor had lost interest. Victor only joined us one time at the Nazarene Church, though we invited him consistently. Deanna began to come regularly. She came many, many times. The truth is, Victor has a very serious problem with alcohol. Next thing I knew, my wife and I heard reports that Deanna had kicked him out of the house. Victor was kicked out of the house. His drinking increased. He was arrested, thrown in prison. When I visited him in prison, he was weeping and sobbing like a baby as I prayed with him and tried to encourage him. When he was released, <laughs> the crazy guy married a client from the restaurant in order to escape deportation. Talk about a mess. I mean, it gets worse and worse. Bad decisions on top of bad decisions. Poor lifestyle on top of poor lifestyle. You know what Victor and Deanna need? Oh, yes, God's hope, God's love, God's peace. Something that will interrupt their hell and give them a new direction. A few months ago, my wife and I were in Razgrad, Bulgaria. We were there for the Nazarene District Assembly. And I used my cell phone. We called Deanna on my cell phone. And the pastor, Nikolai Kolev, he chatted with her from Bulgaria to Florida and prayed with her in Bulgarian on my cell phone. Thank God for the Church of the Nazarene. <laughs> it's wonderful. And we brought her back a Bulgarian Bible. She's been attending regularly, week after week, at the Nazarene Church as a single mother with her two little children. A few weeks ago, my wife and I were in Florida to preach at a revival at that church with Pastor Jim Nash. Deanna came to two of the services with her precious children. Sunday morning, the service featured the baptism of several children who profess faith in Jesus. And over lunch, because we always take them out to eat, <laughs> over lunch I heard Deanna say to six-year-old Patrick, now that's how you're going to be baptized. This congregation has loved and embraced this single mom, and she is growing in the love of Jesus, and her beautiful children are being nurtured in the love of Christ. Thank God for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God has come dear. I, I called Victor when I was preaching the revival. I called several times, and he declined every invitation to come to the revival service. A few days later, however, after I'd left Florida and I was back in my home in Texas, I received a midnight phone call that woke me up, and it was Victor sobbing, crying like a baby. He said he just wanted to hear my voice. <laughs> People that are under the influence of alcohol have strange desires. <laughs> so I'm on the phone praying with Victor, encouraging him. He's trying to get his wife back. He never married her. He's trying to get his kids back. He's abandoned them. He told me, you know what? I, 
I need to go to that Nazarene Alcohol and Drug Rehab Center in Hialeah, Florida. Uh, but I can't go yet because, because I have some debts I have to pay in immigration. But, but after I pay, I want to go. So now I'm calling him almost every two days, praying with him on the phone. Earlier this month, he called me and said, you know, I know what you need to do now. You tell me what passage in the Bible to read every day, and then you and I can talk about it. He wants me to disciple him. I've got news for you. You know what Deanna needs? You know what Victor needs? You know what billions of people on the face of the earth need? Their lives to be transformed by being born again, by the grace of God, entering into the kingdom of God. And how will that happen? How can we reach the victors in our world? How can we reach the Deannas? Preachers, greater evangelists, Bibles thrown from windows of airplanes. How can we reach them? Every Nazarene, prayerfully seeking to build better bridges of love and grace. And over the next three years, just bring one person to Christ. Just decide, bring one person to Christ into the church. We can be 10 million Nazarenes by 2020 if everyone will just bring one during the next seven years. The kingdom of God. It's the lordship of Jesus at work in the church, through the church, transforming people, communities, and nations with hope, love, and peace. Compassion, evangelism. Thirdly, as ambassadors of the kingdom, we practice intentional discipleship. Acts chapter 8 verse 12 says, when the Samaritans believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, men and women. Baptism, that's the first step in discipleship. It is a sacrament, a public testimony. But the sacrament is the church embracing and welcoming the new believer into the family of God. And after baptism, then we pour our lives into these people. We pour our love into these people. We invest in them. Jesus modeled discipleship by investing more time in fewer people. And he taught them to also then invest more time in fewer people. We can't invest less and less time and more and more. Invest more time in fewer people and teach them to do the same. Disciple making is not a curriculum. It's not a program. It's not a book. Jesus focused on intentional, loving, relational discipleship as must we. Jesus was alone, the Bible says. The 12 and the others were about him. They asked him to please explain the parables. He told them the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Another passage says he appeared to them over a period of 40 days after the resurrection. And he spoke to them about what? The kingdom of God. He spent a lot of private time, quality time, not with the thousands. He kept trying to find time and make time to invest in the small core and pour himself deeply into them. Jesus said, I will build my church. Who's going to build the church? Thank you very much. One more time. Jesus said, I will build my church. Who's going to build the church? Welcome. I'm glad you woke up. Jesus says, I will build my church. You make disciples. Sadly, Many of us are attempting to build the church while few of us are intentionally making disciples. The two questions every Nazarene should be able to answer anywhere in the world, every Nazarene, who is discipling you? Don't tell me the TV evangelist and don't tell me you're reading a book. Who is praying for you, investing their life in you? And, and, and who are you discipling? Your children and key people that you're discipling. Hi, my name is Jennifer Brown, and I am from the beautiful island of Jamaica on the Mesoamerica region, where my husband, pastor, disciples me, and I have the privilege of discipling an older woman in my church and two young people. Hola, mi nombre es Carmen Checo de Acosta. Soy de la República Dominicana, una hermosa isla del Caribe. Cuando tenía 17 años, fui, discip fui discipulada por mi profesor de escuela dominical llamado Ramón Méndez. Actualmente estoy discipulando a mi hija, 
eh, Sara Acosta, ella tiene 10 años y para mí es un privilegio tener esa oportunidad. Yo soy Emanuel David de Simas Araújo, eh, superintendente de la Iglesia de Nazareno en Cabo Verde, eh, África Occidental, há cerca de 15 anos. Eu fui discipulado pelo reverendo Gilberto Sabino Évora, que foi superintendente do distrito da Igreja do Nazareno em Cabo Verde. E eu estou a discipular Eliseu Delgado, que é um jovem pastor nas ilhas de Cabo Verde. This is Larry McCain, founder of New Church Specialties and current pastor of Lansing, Michigan, South Church of the Nazarene. Welcome him as he comes to answer these two questions. Larry, answer the two questions for us. I've been really blessed. I've been discipled by Keith Wright and Chick Shaver, Mendel Taylor, Ralph Earl, Craig Wrench, Ray Hearn, Dr. Jerry Porter, and a host of wonderful lay peoples. I'm intentionally now pouring my life into Ken McNulty, Mike Barner, Scott McDaniel, Alex Joslin, Matt Hamlin, Darren Anna Maria Horn, Jeremy Selvage, Mark Walker, and a wonderful church staff we have. Praise God. Thanks, Larry. And here in the front row, we have Craig Wrench from Anaheim, California First Church. Watch this video clip, please. Hi, my name is Craig Wesley Wrench, and I live in Anaheim, California. I'm being discipled by Dr. Jerry Porter, and I disciple a number of guys, including Pastor William Alvarado and Pastor Stephen Lee. Hola, me llamo William Moisés Alvarado. Soy pastor en la ciudad de Anaheim. Yo estoy siendo discipulado por Craig Wesley Range. Y yo estoy discipulando a Andrés Chavarría, Byron Palafox, Alberto Cerna y a mi hijo, William Anthony Alvarado. 안녕하세요. 이봉합니다. And I'm CA Man, Anaheim, 아름다운 교회를 섬기고 있는 이봉하 목사입니다. 저는 지금 Craig Range 목사님에게 디사이플링을 받고 있고요. 저는 Sean, Ben, Charles, 그리고 제딸 Rebecca를 Discipling, Cheja Saibul Hawismita. Bonjour, je m'appelle Suzanne, je suis de la Guyana. Linda me donne la formation de disciple et je donne la formation de disciple à Stephanie et Patricia. This is Pastor Josie Galvan, who serves with her husband, Pastor Douglas, at the Independence, Missouri, Kairos Church of the Nazarene. Josie. ¿Puedes, por favor, contestar estas dos preguntas? Bienvenida. La pastora Nineye Herrera me está discipulando y yo estoy discipulando a Brenda Ulloa, Alma Godoy, Rosario Islas, Blanca Castañón, Becky Mendoza, Lucy Trudeau, Alicia Inestrosa, Nereida Ayara, Carolina Bravo y Ceci Godoy. ¿Qué pasaría si cada nazareno pudiera contestar estas dos preguntas? El discipulado no es solamente para nuevos creyentes, sino que cada cristiano maduro necesita ser discipulado y hacer discípulos y, a, y ser discipulado como un estilo de vida, ya que nuestra misión es hacer discípulos semejantes a Cristo en las naciones. Amén. Gracias, Josie. What would happen if two million Nazarenes, each one would gather five disciples during the next seven years? If every Nazarene would pray and say, Lord, I have a child, two children, I have some people at church, I have someone that I led to Christ, what if every Nazarene would, would spend the next seven years and say, Lord, you discipled 12, Paul discipled 25, and I, I want you to allow me to at least disciple five. If every Nazarene would disciple five and find those during the next seven years, guess what, folks? There will be 10 million Nazarenes by 2020 by the grace of God and to the glory of God. Finally, as ambassadors of the kingdom, 
we dedicate our lives to church planting, church development. In Luke chapter 4, we sense the heart of our Lord. I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns because that is why I was sent. Why do we multiply churches? Because we reach new people. Every church becomes a kingdom of God embassy. Paul and Barnabas preached the gospel in Derby. They won a large number of disciples. And they returned to the cities of Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. That was their message. The scripture continues, Paul and Barnabas appointed leaders and elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord. Missionaries Paul and Barnabas, they developed pastors and they organized churches. It never occurred to these missionaries to evangelize and not start churches. In fact, Paul himself planted a church in his own home when he was under house arrest. The scripture says that for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house, welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God. That seems to be the consistent message of the New Testament church. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught all about the Lord Jesus Christ with boldness and without hindrance. New Testament churches, they were primarily house churches, and they reproduced themselves. It's not the denomination that plants churches. It's not even the districts that plant churches. Congregations must plant congregations, churches launching churches. Where should we start these new churches? Everywhere. We've traditionally been more effective in church planting in the small towns, in the rural communities. But now, however, the Lord's going to have to help us. We must find a way to multiply churches in the great cities of our world. In 1800, there were only six cities of over one million inhabitants. Today, there are almost 500 such cities. One-fourth of the world's population lives in those 500 cities. Half of the world's population now lives in cities and towns. We must find the methods God will bless to multiply congregations in the cities and the towns around the world. Traditional church planting, purchasing property, building buildings is not reproducible. We must embrace a house church multiplication movement that will allow us to plant literally thousands of churches around the world in the two or three or four years coming. In a few moments, the regions will introduce to you specific people groups and significant cities that are being targeted in the coming years on these six regions of our church. Would you pray with us for God to send workers to this global harvest field? The kingdom of God has come near. So how do our 28,000 Nazarene congregations become 120,000 congregations? Yes, it's simple, isn't it? If every Nazarene church would launch one new daughter church every three years. We will have 120,000 congregations by 2020, seven years from now. If you know how to dream, then dream this dream. Today, we have one Nazarene church for every 250,000 people on the face of the earth. But by 2020, we could have one for every 60,000 people. Glory to God. The Board of General Superintendents definition of a church is any group that meets regularly for spiritual nurture, worship, and instruction at a communicated time and place with an identified leader aligned with the message and mission of the Church of the Nazarene with the purpose of becoming an organized church. That's the church. Nope, not talking about property or buildings or insurance. We're talking about by the grace of God, churches, multiplying churches, and valiant people saying, God has laid on my heart to start a church in that next community and the next ethnic group to the glory of God. Watch a video from the Missouri District, USA. I think exercising your body is a lot like exercising your heart. You know, if you don't exercise your body, you never grow. Your body becomes stagnant. And it's the same way with your heart. 
uh, in our relationship with God, we're never supposed to stay at one point. We're supposed to move f further. We're supposed to grow in our relationship with Him. And that takes discipline, and it takes time, and it takes obedience, and it takes doing something about it. We had district assembly, and Dr. Jerry Porter spoke, and he spoke exactly about what was on my heart. I remember what he said. He said, what is failure? If one person gets saved, if one person is impacted by this, it's all worth it. I remember driving uh, on the way home that night, thinking, I'm going to go do this. One day, I got a call from my home church saying, we would really like you to come and talk to us and see if you're the right guy for this. And so Kate and I went, and we interviewed, and we talked to the uh, 12 individuals in a community room at the firehouse in Troy uh, talking about what was on our hearts and these people had the same passion for their community that I did and it seemed like something that, that God wanted to happen and so Kate and I resigned from our positions in Nebraska and 30 days later we're on our way uh, moving to Troy, Missouri to start a brand new church and on February 19th we had our first grand opening uh, at, as New Life Troy. Today, New Life Troy in Troy, Missouri is uh, flourishing. Uh, we've started with just 30 people wanting to help and wanting to serve, and now we're uh, averaging over 70 every week, and people's lives are being changed. People are uh, making commitments to God and wanting to get saved and wanting to help out. I'm just so thankful to God for everything that He's done. I had so many concerns and so many worries, and there are so many reasons people don't go out and plant churches, because it is scary. But God has taken care of every single detail, every single worry, and through prayer and relying on Him, uh, He has provided and taken care of and blessed uh, my family and the people of our church more than I could ever imagine. That video was taken just two weeks ago, praise God. Can you sense what's happening? The kingdom of God has come near. We have a video from Reverend Sukumal Biswas, founder of the Church of the Nazarene in Bangladesh. 20 years ago, there were no Nazarenes, no Nazarene congregations in Bangladesh. Watch this video. Uh, when we started in 1993, uh, we have Jiro. Uh, believers in Bangladesh, Nazrin believers. Uh, since 1993 and uh, uh, 2012, uh, we officially organized 243 organized churches, over uh, 93,000 members. So the thing is that uh, our people is very simple, but they are committed to go and tell the people about the Jesus Christ. That's uh, he is um, the savior. That's really make a significant impact. But the main thing is that the local church or local people, uh, they, are, they are reaching their, uh, their relatives. When they became Christians, converted, they go to their own people, own relatives, own community. So village goes to the another village. So that's the secret of the growing the churches. So would you welcome Sukumal here in the front row? Thank you, Brother Sukumal, for your valiant courage for God. For your great, great courage for God. And uh, would you pray for his safety? Radical groups have uh, put him on a, a hit list and there's a price on his head. Pray for his safety, please. The kingdom of God has come near. Have you helped the kingdom of God to come near? Can we get more involved? The kingdom of God has come near. My wife and I had the joy of living in San Jose, Costa Rica. I served as rector of the Nazarene Seminary of the Americas. One afternoon, a missionary colleague, Juan Vasquez Pla, and I were running errands downtown San Jose, and we agreed we would meet at the Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant and then drive back to the seminary together. I got to the restaurant before him, and I was waiting there with my Diet Coke, and the tables were all full, and I, I invited a woman and her nine-year-old son to sit in the booth across from me because there was nowhere else for her to sit. And while Mauricio, her son, was enjoying his chicken, 
Daidamia began to weep and told me that they had just come from the doctor and that Mauricio was going to lose his eyesight and that there was really no hope for him. My heart was deeply moved and I asked her for the information about the disease and contact information. I prayed with her and then I contacted my college classmate, medical doctor Gary Morsh, and I asked what medicine would you think we could use for this illness? Of course, he was quite reticent to prescribe medicine sight unseen, but after some persistence, he finally gave me the information. Our car was in the repair shop. It always was. Missionary cars love repair shops. So we caught the bus from San Jose, from, uh, pardon me, from Goicochea, downtown San Jose. We went to the pharmacy. We bought the medicine. Then we caught a second bus to Alajuela. There we caught the third bus that took us up the side of the volcano to the town of San Pedro de Poas. The driver informed us as we got off the bus that that was the last bus that night, and if we wanted to sleep in town, just take your time. I'm leaving in 20 minutes, and if you're not here, you're going to spend the night in this town. So we rushed with the address, found the home, gave the medicine to Deidamia and Francisco, her husband, prayed with them, and rushed back to the bus. By now it was dark. (laughs) <laughs> and the bus was winding its way down this narrow mi- mountain road and, and had bad electrical system and the lights would totally go off. It was totally pitch black and my wife hugged me all the way to Alajuela. It was wonderful. <laughs> Every time we had work teams visiting us in, at the seminary, we would schedule a, a work and witness trip, a side trip to go visit the volcano, the Poas Volcano. And whenever we did, we always called Edamia, and we would drop in and visit with her. And soon she began to invite the children from the neighborhood. And my wife, Tony, would teach a Bible study to them every time we were coming through town. So every time we went through town, we gathered the children and had a Bible study, had a Bible study. Meanwhile, back at the seminary, we announced to every student that they would have to be involved in a church planting project or they would not graduate. So, on one occasion, we took some students to see the volcano, and on the way back, Daniel Perez from Peru, he's on the left here, he asked if he could start a church in the house of Deidamia. He said he liked her cooking. If I have to start a church, I'll start one here, he said. Thus, he began his trips, three bus rides every weekend to and from the seminary to San Pedro. And a center of holy fire, as Brazil called these new churches, was begun in Deidamia's home. Later, Roberto Hodgson, Begardo Bardales, students were assigned to that same house church. The congregation grew and flourished. In fact, they had a victory march through the town from the house where they were worshiping to a house on the city square that the church itself rented as their new worship location. Today, this congregation is the largest Nazarene congregation in all of Costa Rica, nearly 250 in weekly worship. And Mauricio... He never lost his eyesight. Praise God. So what does it take to plant a church? A little compassion, an open home, a new outreach ministry, a leader, and a church is born. We need to find every possible method to reproduce all kinds of new congregations everywhere in the world. And by the grace of God, you and I are ambassadors of the kingdom, and we can make it happen. I want you to welcome, please, Johnny Calvo. Don't clap yet. He is the uh, Costa Rica North District Superintendent, and he's also the pastor of the San Pedro Poas Church. Wait. Also, Begardo Bardales from Southeast, uh, Central Southeast Honduras District Superintendent. Roberto Hodgson, USA, Canada, Multicultural Ministries Coordinator, and Brian Wilson, Chicago Central District. Please now join me in welcoming these visionary leaders. (laughs) Dinos, Johnny, ¿cuál es tu visión para tu iglesia y para el Distrito de Costa Rica Norte? La visión de la iglesia es comunicar las buenas nuevas de nuestro Señor Jesucristo a miles de personas que habitan en la ciudad de Poaz y que la iglesia sea un lugar donde los heridos, los deprimidos y los confundidos puedan encontrar amor, 
aceptación, esperanza, perdón, guía y aliento. Nuestra visión para nuestro Distrito Norte en Costa Rica es que cada iglesia pueda plantar una nueva iglesia, que cada pastor pueda desarrollar un nuevo pastor y que cada ciudad del territorio de nuestro distrito haya una iglesia del Nazareno que predique el mensaje de la santidad, el reino de Dios se ha acercado. Roberto and uh, Begardo, uh, what did you learn about the kingdom of God as you planted the church in San Pedro de Poas? Cuando llegué al seminario, me asignaron de pastor a San Pedro de Poas. Viajaba todos los fines de semana, pasaba mis vacaciones viviendo en el local de la iglesia y en ocasiones cortando café, eh, donaba el dinero para los juguetes navideños de los niños. Amen. Esta experiencia me sirvió para conocer mejor a algunos de los hermanos. Durante mis tres años y medio allí, vimos un crecimiento integral. Gloria a Dios. Hoy represento a los líderes latinos en Estados Unidos y Canadá, Amen. quienes hemos abrazado Visión 2020, duplicar el número de iglesias de 500 Amen. a 1,000 para el año 2020. Aleluya. El reino de Dios se ha acercado. Gloria a Dios. Agradezco a Dios la oportunidad de ministrar con Roberto Hoxon en San Pedro de Poás. Pudimos compartir el glorioso mensaje transformador de Cristo en esta nueva iglesia. Para mi vida fue una experiencia muy especial. Amén. En Honduras, en las últimas dos décadas, hemos plantado 72 iglesias Amén. para la gloria de Dios. Gloria a Dios. La visión del Distrito Sur Oriente Central de Honduras es seguir plantando iglesias del Nazareno en cada aldea, pueblo y ciudad, formando hombres, mujeres, niños y niñas a la semejanza de Jesucristo. El reino de Dios se ha acercado. Gloria a Dios. And uh, Brian, what are you learning about church planting as the Chicago Central District has partnered with Costa Rica North District Nazarenes? Yeah. The impact of the Chicago Central District partnership with the Costa Rica North District has truly been transformational. In the past two years, over 100 of our members have taken the very first uh, work and witness trip of their lives uh, to work on a project in Costa Rica. Four of our members have been called and to serve and then deployed to serve as volunteer Nazarene missionaries. But perhaps even more transforming and impacting has been the contagious church planning vision and the faith that our Costa Rican brothers Amen. and sisters have modeled for us in Chicago. So now God has given us a vision for planning a church in every one of the 77 neighborhoods of the great city of Chicago. He's sending us bivocational mm -hmm. church planters who have a passion for our holiness mission in this great urban context. The kingdom of God has come near. So would the Lord of the harvest be pleased with the Church of the Nazarene if we grew to 10 million members in the near future? We are God's leaven in the world. Sometimes Nazarenes uh, are negative. Sometimes we're even critical. Sometimes we find a fault with every little thing that's wrong with our church and, and we despair because, oh, we're just the Church of the Nazarene. We're just a little old, small, unknown, inconsequential, holiness church, insignificant, frail, flawed, human. Meanwhile, Jesus sees the Church of the Nazarene as part of his great kingdom. And when he looks at us, what does he see? When he looks at us here and looks at our pastors around the world and our churches around the world, what does the Lord see? He sees us as the kingdom of God, yeast, the leaven that will leaven the whole world, that through us and all other Christians, but through us transforming people, communities, and nations to the glory of God. 
We pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're crying out to God. We want God's purposes to be accomplished among us. We want God's will to be accomplished among us. We want to partner with whatever it is God's trying to do in the church of the Nazarene. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a man that scatters seed on the ground. And then whether he sleeps or gets up, it makes no difference. The seed sprouts and it grows. He doesn't even know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. You and I must take responsibility to plant the seed. God makes it grow, but you and I must plant the seed. We are ambassadors of the kingdom. And if we don't win our family and friends to Christ, no one will. If we don't disciple these Christians and our family, no one will. If we don't plant these churches, they will never be started. Someone planted your church. Someone evangelized you. And by the grace of God, someone discipled you. We are now the ambassadors of the kingdom who must take our place. So I just want to expand your vision, expand your dream. I've shared this with our board. We got on our knees and prayed. What if the Lord really wanted us to become 10 million? Maybe the Lord's tired of us talking about 2.18 million. Maybe the Lord's tired of 28,000, whatever. Maybe the Lord wants 10 million Nazarenes in the next seven years. Maybe the Lord would be pleased with 120,000 congregations around the world. Maybe the Lord wants us, by the grace of God, each one to win one person every three years. Each one of us find just five disciples in the next seven years. Each one of us get involved with our church. Never debate against church planting. If you as a pastor, never debate against church planting. If you've got laymen in your church that want to plant a church, encourage them. And if you don't want to encourage them, at least don't say anything because you shouldn't debate against church planting. And if you're a layman, don't debate against church planting. If the pastor's all excited, don't throw cold water on the pastor who wants to plant a church. Someone debated against your church being planted, but thank God they lost. Let's have courage. Let's be kingdom people. Would it please the Lord for our global Nazarene family, our fellowship around the world to grow to 10 million in 120,000 congregations by 2020. Well, last night was a stirring moment. We watched the 159 flags, 159 world areas. They were representing the world areas, and we, we celebrated what God has done thus far. In some of those nations, like in Bangladesh, we're the largest evangelical church there. Other places, we are very, very, very small seed in a great nation where we need to see what God can do. We celebrate what God has done thus far. But now tonight, dream with me the dream of what God would yet want to do through the people called Nazarenes. Tonight we're going to have some banners. These banners were prepared by the various regions of our church. And these banners represent cities. These banners represent people groups where we are not yet. And tonight you're going to watch the march of world areas and people groups celebrating what God is doing. And as they march in, I want you to notice that there are many, many places where the regions say we still need to go to these places, these cities, these people groups to the glory of God. I invite you this evening, in your seat you found a covenant card. And in just a moment I'm going to ask you if you'd be willing to take that covenant card and to, uh, and to join one of these banners. These banners are going to be up and down all the aisles. And as they're in the aisles, I'm going to ask you, uh, would you be willing to be a partner? Would your church be a partner? Would you be willing to say, yes, we'll pray, we'll give, we'll go to these mission targets? Take that uh, mission covenant card. And would you join me, please, as I fill out my card? And I say, yes, I want to be a partner in what God is doing around the world. And when these banners are all finally in place, after they've taken their place, I'd like everyone to stand even if you don't fill out a card, I want everyone to stand and gather around these banners and pray for the city or the nation or the people group closest to where you're seated and pray for God's grace to come on these cities and God's grace to come on these people groups. And those of you who have filled out the card, 
give the card to the persons who are carrying the banners. They'll take these back and we'll contact you and we'll help your church and your district and your family to connect with these wonderful mission assignments around the world. Tonight, we're making a fresh new covenant to be an ambassador of the kingdom of God. We ask the lights to come up and the march of the nations, the cities, and the people groups where we are not yet at this time. If you're willing to be an ambassador of the kingdom, just give us your name and email address. Just give us your name and email address. We'll contact you. We'll give you some options to connect, some partnership opportunities. And I'd like everyone now just to cluster around these leaders. These leaders have brought these, these uh, very important cities to our attention, these very important people groups to our attention. So would you just come out, step out from where, wherever you are and gather around these. Let's cluster around these and we're going to have a time of prayer. Let's pray that God would invade and with his grace would touch. We could multiply disciples, multiply believers, multiply churches, uh, these cities all around the world. From where I am, I wish you could see what I can see. These, uh, these banners all over the room of the cities and the towns that are waiting for us, that are inviting us, that are calling us. Go ahead and make your way. Back, put your hand on the shoulder of the person in front of you and let's, let's reach out and say, Lord, I want to be a part of what you're trying to do in these cities, trying to do in these people groups, what you're trying to accomplish. Lord, I want to be a part of that. I want to be an ambassador to win the lost. I want to be a, a witness for Jesus. I want to make disciples. And I want to be involved in church planting. I want to see a multiplication of churches around the world. I'm going to ask Gustavo Croker to lead us in a prayer as we cluster around these cities and we cluster around these wonderful mission assignments that are waiting for us. Let's rise to the challenge as we pray together. Father, we receive the charge to go and make Christ-like disciples in the nations. We go to our neighborhoods. We we'll go to our families. We go to our workplace. We go to remote lands. We go with boldness. We go with uh, faith. We go because we are empowered by your Holy Spirit. We entrust to your care every city, every nation, every tribe, every land that you have put in front of us. Send your people, we pray. Send your people, we pray. Send your people, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please uh, leave your covenant card with the people that are holding the banners. Just give your covenant card to these people. Leave your covenant card. Or later, bring it to uh, any one of our offices here. We want to connect with you. You may return to your seats, please, for one final song. Please return to your seats for one final song. Ambassadors of the kingdom. The kingdom of God. God's hope, God's love, and its peace have come near. Let's sing together, Build Your Kingdom Here. It may be a new song for some of you, but I believe you'll pick it up as we sing. Let's celebrate the kingdom of God has come near. Amen. <laughs> Heavenly Father, help us to dream a big dream. Put vision in our hearts. Put energy in our souls. Revive within us the ability to believe something greater than we've ever believed before. And now in the power of your spirit, may we truly be your witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. We pray it together in the name of Jesus, Lord of the nations, Lord of the church, Lord of all. Amen. And amen. God bless you and God go with you.